This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. This week on our panel, we have Nader Debit. Hello. We have a special guest host that's Sia Caramelagos. <laughs> yes, hello. I kind of sounded that out in my head first. I hope I got close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that's James Sinclair. Good day. Hi from Australia. Now, uh, the show's pretty new, so obviously we haven't had you on before. Do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, I'm a web developer. I uh, work in Canberra, Australia, which is actually the capital city. Um, and uh, I work for a, an organization called Squiz, um, building a uh, what we call a digital workplace, which is kind of like a fancier term for intranet. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, well, we have you on to talk about, I'm trying to remember because it was like all kinds of, it was like three or four things. It was React, Redux, and JavaScript architecture, which all seems pretty general. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was probably because of an article I wrote, um, which was uh, inspired by the work I do at Squeeze, um, where I found that um, most of the people I talked to um, didn't really understand why you would ever want to use React. Um, most people were coming from a jQuery background, uh, and I could point them to plenty of uh, articles to get started. Um, so here's how you do uh, a, a React application. Here's how you get started with Redux, with the sort of tutorial how-to guides. But nobody was really explaining why you would want to use them. Gotcha. So are the people that you're working with, are they, have they been working with JavaScript for a long time and they're just kind of um, skeptical about like getting into some of the faster evolving um, ecosystems in JavaScript or is it uh, kind of um, more like they're very comfortable with, with jQuery and it's getting the job done and they're not really interested in learning something if like what they have isn't broken? So a bit of both, I think. So there's a mixture of, of people. Some people were sort of uh, junior developers um, and we're just sort of finding their way uh, around modular JavaScript in particular. And then a bunch of other people who were just used to using jQuery for everything um, and, and didn't really see what the benefits were. Uh, and it also came out of collaborating on a particular project where um, as uh, things happened, the, the project got behind schedule. And so uh, one of the developers jumped ahead and started uh, doing the sort of static cut up work um, building the HTML, CSS, and, and chucking some uh, jQuery into uh, to do the basic sort of in interactions. Uh, and then I came along behind him and was doing some of the more complicated work uh, for, say, integrating credit cards and um, uh, more more beefier parts of the system. And I was using React, and we saw that you could see the code side by side. Um, and he was writing all this monolithic um, jQuery that was really hard to debug and um, really long and complicated. Uh, and he, he was kind of flabbergasted by this, uh, these tiny little React modules that I was creating that he was calling the, the magical. Um, because he couldn't quite understand what they were doing, but he could see that they were much more elegant than, than the way the jQuery code was working. Yeah, I read your article and I, um, I really enjoyed it. I feel like it was a good reminder, even for experienced devs, of like why we use React. We already have ideas in our head, like, the way we think of components and building web pages as a series of components. But I liked a lot of the other points you brought up, like how it's just faster to, um, to look up a value in a plain JavaScript object versus querying the DOM. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember the first time that um, I was kind of convinced that React was uh, a good idea was at a conference um, where, of all things, they were talking about immutability. Um, and, and the own framework. And so um, there was this, it was basically a really, really long talk uh, all about how triple equals is much faster than um, uh, comparing uh, objects with a deep compare when you dive in and compare every single value inside. Um, 
And in some ways, that's the whole story of why React can be fast is because a triple equals is, is a much faster lookup than, than doing a deep object compare. But not many people sort of understand that or why that is, why React the way it is. Uh, and I also find that even just modular um, web components uh, are a, a big idea for some of the junior developers I talk to. So I wanted to break all that down and, and explain uh, here's, here's why React is the way it is. Uh, and you don't have to be too scared of the JSX if you don't want to be. <laughs> so is your team moving now to React or have you already moved to React or how is that looking at your, at your company? Um, so my particular team has moved to, to React. Um, so uh, when we started this project um, for Squiz Workplace, uh, we mandated that this will be React. Uh, we developed our own uh, special technique for making React work well with a CMS. Uh, which was um, interesting and fun. Uh, the rest of the company, they're, they're a mixture because if, if you're doing a small website, um, you don't always need the full-blown power of React. You, you sprinkle of jQuery here and there will work and, and get the job done. Um, but for larger, more complicated applications, like the one I work on, we're doing React. What about Redux? I mean, you, you put in React, Redux, and JavaScript architecture. So I, I've, I've heard some uh, people push back on Redux, that it's too complicated or that it's, um, you know, it's not always necessary. Well, where do you kind of come down on that? <laughs> uh, that's a that's a really good point. So, um, the, I, I did put a, a section on, on on Redux in that article as well because I, I saw a spate of um, uh, articles going around saying, "Oh, Redux is uh, is over. Redux has, has had it. It's um, we're moving on. We're writing our own version." And most of them seem to be listing all the advantages of Redux as if they were disadvantages. So, uh, things like it's oh, you, you have to have pure reducers and the only way to set, uh, set state is through these reducer things. And you know, there's so much, it's so lacking in opinionation. So uh, I can do anything I want. And I'm thinking these are, these are all good things. Um, but it does lend itself to a particular kind of application where you do have a lot of shared state, uh, where you have uh, different parts of the application that need to interact with each other. Uh, so what Redux does is it organizes things so that you can, uh, have a consistent, uh, understandable way of understanding. If I change something uh, way down in the, the component tree, uh, I know exactly what's going to happen um, to my state as a result of that. Now, I was just kind of curious, though, like what, what's the current stack that you're kind of uh, of choice for you? If you were going to build something brand new like today, like what would you use as far as like a JavaScript stack uh, in the React ecosystem? Um, for me, I'd, I'd run pretty vanilla uh, uh, React and Redux. Uh, I'd probably uh, downshift hadn't been released at the time that uh, we started our project, um, so that would have been a, a handy thing because uh, we do do a lot of sort of type ahead type widgets, uh, which that is designed to 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 make easier. Uh, but mainly just a bit of a webpack to glue everything together and React and Redux uh, to manage state uh, and, and build out our components. Um, and has any of you heard of something called Conditioner JS? Mm -hmm. mm -mm. So that's a, a short little library um, that um, what it does is it scans your, your page uh, looking at the DOM and looks for data attributes. Uh, and if any merge a particular pattern, it says, oh, this uh, component on the page needs to be a React component. Uh, and it will hydrate, uh, as they say, um, that particular part of the DOM and replace it with your dynamic component. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is because we um, independently invented our own particular uh, version of that um, so that it would work with a CMS. Because a CMS, you don't always have uh, a single page app. Um, so most React tutorials uh, assume that you're making a single page web app. Uh, whereas we're working with a CMS. So we need some way to say when we, when we load the HTML in the page, these particular parts of the page need to be uh, React components and they need to be initialized with all the Redux um, state as well. Uh, so we wrote a little library that will scan, scan for those data attributes. And I thought I was particularly clever, um, but it turns out somebody else has already built a, an open source library for it. <laughs> nice. I, I kind of want to go back to some of the ideas that you had around, you said kind of sprinkles of jQuery. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, and you mentioned it in the article too that you know React might be overkill, 
And then you've also talked about maybe you just put React in in, in situations where you're not building a single page app. So I'm kind of trying to figure out where you split the difference, right? Where do you just say, okay, well, this app, yeah, you know, some jQuery, I'm good, you know, or maybe, you know, something lightweight like Stimulus.js. And then maybe you're looking at it and you're going, okay, well, maybe, maybe my sprinkles really need to be React components. And then you get to the point where you're saying, you know what, this needs to be a fully blown full page app, single page app. Yeah, I, I guess it, it depends on, on what you're building. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're starting out with the intention of building an app, then um, probably a single page app is, is the, t- the tool you want to reach for. Uh, and these days with server-side rendering, that's that's a whole lot easier. Um, for our particular use case, uh, we're working with a, a CMS that's similar to something like Drupal or WordPress, um, but we wanted to layer a lot of complicated application logic on top of that. So we wanted to have all the benefits of a of, of a CMS, but also we have these complicated messaging systems and um, uh, in sort of social media style commenting things. Uh, this is kind of what digital workplaces do. Um, and we knew that we had a, a fairly heavy su- support burden. Um, so we'd have people calling us up and um, things like the, the Redux time traveler make uh, supporting and debugging uh, much easier. Uh, so we wanted to have those sort of tools available to help us out in the future. Um, so yeah, so I guess the two key things for me, if you're building an application, then build a single page web app. Uh, if you need um, lots of shared state, then Redux is the tool of choice. Um, and yeah, if you're just building a website that needs a carousel on it, maybe you don't need a, a huge framework like React. Gotcha. What about Redux? So Redux is trickier. Um, it, my rule of thumb is tends to be when I know that a lot of different components are going to be sharing state um, and that's potentially going to be confusing, that's when I re- reach for Redux because that's, that's its core value is... Um, You've got a bunch of components that interact and it's not always obvious how one is going to affect the other. That makes sense. And then I guess the last, the last, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's, that's the beautiful thing about Redux is it's not as complicated as, as people make out. It's, it's quite a really, quite a simple library. You could write it yourself. But it's, it's just that because it's so simple, it, it's kind of like the, the game of Go. I don't know if you've, any of you have ever played that. It only has a few very simple rules, but because of that, it becomes very complicated in all the things that can possibly happen because it's quite a large board. Um, I find Redux is, is similar in that there's only a very few small number of rules, which means you can do a whole lot with it um, because you, you're quite free uh, to to take it in any direction you want. Yeah, I like this idea of um, the concepts or or for me, at least, learning Redux really helped me think in a more functional way. And um, I like how you frame that, how these concepts are also more portable to learning. To me, that's really interesting how you can apply those things. Like when I, once I realized I was basically building Redux in a vanilla JavaScript app, I was like, well, maybe I should just use Redux. <laughs> That's a really good point. I'm glad you bring up uh, functional programming as well. Um, that heavily influenced why I... I thought Redux was a good idea when I saw it uh, because I'd been starting down that journey of uh, learning about functional programming and it it makes a lot of sense um, to be able to, particularly when you're managing state, um, to be able to say, okay, I know that when I I make this change, I know exactly what's going to happen in my application. Um, And so it makes testing easier. It makes reasoning about the code easier. And um, as I was sort of pointing out in the article, it makes a whole bunch of other stuff uh, suddenly possible that wasn't possible before. Yeah. So how do you try to convince someone? Because I, I do feel like a lot of people don't necessarily learn like the core concepts of Redux before they um, like pass judgment on it. Or I mean, of course, and everyone has different needs, but how, how do you kind of make that case? Um, that's a tough one. Um, generally, um, if, if I'm leading the team, then I just mandate that that's what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> um, but my, my approach is actually to start with functional programming. Actually, I think once people, even just the, the functional iterators like map filter reduce, um, once people will start to use those in their code, um, and they, they see a whole lot of complexity suddenly disappear. Um, cause that's the beauty of those things is right. You, you write one line. Um, and that expresses what four lines were doing before with a for loop. Um, 
and it expresses more information in less less lines of code. So when you when you see map, you know that it's creating another array with the same length. Um, with a for loop, you have to read through the whole thing to work out whether that's what it's doing or not. Um, so once people start to get functional programming, then Redux makes a whole lot more sense as well as React. Um, and so people start coming along that journey. Uh, also, um, even just for convincing people to use React itself, um, if they haven't been doing modular uh, JavaScript before, that's, that it kind of blows their minds that they can they can um, build much neater, much smaller, easier to manage components that, that don't uh, need to be these massive blobs of jQuery code. So I'm kind of curious, what's your uh, thoughts on GraphQL and have you used GraphQL at your company? Uh, we are just experimenting it uh, with it at the moment, sorry. Um, we, uh, a, a colleague of mine just spun up a server um, that would uh, interrogate our, our CMS database and, and expose it as an API. Um, but we're just starting down that path. Um, but I can see from what I've read about it and, and little bits that I have done with it, that it, it's uh, going to be particularly useful for reducing the number of queries and joins that we do and um, could speed up our development time a lot. Um, have you guys uh, started down that journey? You, you're doing a lot with uh, GraphQL these days? So I've done quite a bit with it lately because I work with AWS and we're building the managed GraphQL service called uh, AWS AppSync. Um, and I've never actually built anything in production there, so I'm kind of more working on the developer advocacy side, kind of um, integrating new features and stuff into that service and talking with developers, kind of finding out what they're looking for. Um, in my experience, though, the hardest part for me has always been to build a real a real world GraphQL server that actually implements things like authorization um, mm -hmm. controls and fine grain access control and things like that. Um, I think just spinning up a pretty basic um, server has gotten pretty easy at this point. There's a lot of um, good stuff out there like Apollo Server and Prisma, but um, I think taking taking it from Hello World to actually something useful is like the problem that has yet to be solved, I would say, like uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a simple way. We're trying to do that with AppSync, and then I think we're going to see a lot of stuff happen over the next year, and other, other companies might be um, introducing some things for that space because I feel like that's kind of an unsolved area so far. I do like, um, have you heard of Apollo Link State? So it's kind of uh, Apollo's answer to managing state, but within GraphQL. So if you already have a GraphQL backend, how can we start managing state with that same idea? And I feel like that, that might be a compelling thing for me to switch. Clearly, I like Redux, but, um, <laughs> but like yeah, something that, that kind of changes the paradigm, <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. You were yeah, I saw someone give a talk on that recently, and it was the first time I'd actually seen what it was. I had heard of it. And that uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me until I actually saw someone kind of give a talk on it. And um, after that, I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. So it's basically like you have your Redux store, you know, saved like elsewhere in your application at, uh, at, at its own little uh, area and its own level. And then your whole app kind of has access to that data, that state. It's something like that, except that, um, of course, instead of using Redux, you're using um, whatever you would like, really. But you're also getting the benefits of getting your GraphQL queries and mutations and stuff like that all handled through the link state. Yeah, it does sound pretty cool. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up the uh, authentication side of things um, because um, uh, I really need to write an article on this, but we, we still work with um, these traditional old CMSs like uh, Drupal or, or Squiz Matrix, which is our particular one. Uh, and uh, there are a few things that a CMS still gives you for free uh, and things like authentication and um, roles and uh, login screens and, and admin screens uh, that uh, often when we charge in to try and uh, create these single page web apps, uh, you forget that um, CMSs have solved a lot of these problems a long time ago. Uh, and if, you, if you're building an application, that, that can be a, a sort of good base for starting something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've been looking at that for... Uh, the podcast, right? Just, uh, you know, basing a lot of the access that people want to the media or to the, you know, the different uh, things that are involved there. And uh, yeah, I, I've been using WordPress as my backend and just trying to figure out, okay, how do I open all this stuff up? And 
WordPress does have an API and they also do have GraphQL plugins, but um, they, you know, it's not completely 100%, you know, clear how to use all that stuff. But at the same time, you know, all the data structures and everything else are pretty well understood. And so you can get a, a leg up that way without having to design the entire system. Yeah, exactly. And it doesn't take long before it, that uh, permissions type stuff can get really complicated. Um, so having someone else who's done some of that hard thinking for you can be really, really helpful. Yeah, it seems like we don't talk about um, CMSs as much as we really should. Because I wonder how many, like, you know, when we apply to real production applications, how many of them are CMSs? And we just kind of ignore that fact when we, when we go to conferences and we hear talks and things. <laughs> They're all about more traditional backends. Yeah, I have in my head that I really want to uh, write an article on this um, about making uh, React and Redux and things work with your creaky old CMS because we, we do kind of treat them like they're the, the sort of old, uh, hairy old, the scary um, monsters that nobody wants to talk about anymore. But they, they do do a lot and power a lot of the, the internet that we use uh, day to day. Now, I'm curious, does that change the structure of your front-end app at all, if your back-end is a CMS? Uh, yes, it does. Um, uh, so that's, that's why I was bringing up Conditioner earlier, um, because the way that um, CMSs work is you never know in advance uh, what you're going to need on that page. Um, so you may know that you need, say, a menu, for example, that uh, needs drop-downs that you want to control. But you don't know what else might be on that page. So you have to be prepared for anything, um, which means that um, things like code splitting and um, being able to quickly um, hydrate your application uh, without too much lag time uh, become really, really important when you're looking at performance. So I don't know about you guys, but have you guys uh, done much uh, performance uh, sort of tuning of your React applications? Oh, yeah, actually this is a topic I really love it sounds so dry but I actually really like diving into performance although now I've taken it even beyond react and more looking at um, like how we build and how the how the browser renders things and, and things like that but um, <laughs> definitely an exciting topic um, what kind of tools do you use for performance uh optimization so in terms of actually uh, getting optimizations, we we dove pretty heavily into the Webpack code splitting uh, when that was updated it's sort of mm -hmm. about a year ago now. Um, so for us, it, it makes a lot of sense because we can optimize first load. We know that sort of 80% of the time somebody's coming into the home page, so we can make sure that we've got everything we need in, in the bundle for that. Um, but if somebody is just on the home page. We they don't necessarily need all the full calendar features, um, for example, or they, they don't necessarily need um, the crazy org chart um, application that we, we built. So when you go to those pages, we we download those dynamically on the fly, um, and we just we display a sort of uh, grayed out placeholder while that code's downloading. So does having a CMS backend make that whole process more complicated? I'm imagining it would, but I'm, I don't actually know. Well, that's where we found that, um, so writing our own version of Conditioner uh, really helped. Um, so um, what CMSs are really, really good at is putting HTML in a page. Um, and if you can s indicate in that HTML, uh, this, this particular blob of content here that needs to be transformed into a, a, a dynamic React component. Uh, so we do that with the data attributes, and then um, we have one to say this is the type of React component it should be, so the name of the component that it is, and then we also pass in uh, attributes, uh, kind of like you would pass in React props. Um, we just have to double encode them uh, so that they can fit in HTML. Uh, and then that allows us to pass information from the CMS through to the React component, um, just like you would if you were doing a, a, a normal sort of React JSX. Um, and then when we hydrate that, we pass that information through and it all uh, just, it's kind of magical. It all just works. For you, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code bridge10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, 
Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Yeah, I'm an old Reyes dev. I like magic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd love to hear about uh, what other people are doing to um, sort of performance tune their, their React apps, if, if you guys are working on any of that kind of stuff. I'm still learning React, so I'm happy when it works. <laughs> Um, I've worked a lot with React Native, really, and uh, with React Native, there's a few different things that you can do, but but really, it has a lot to do with, at least in my experience, optimizing um, optimizing render methods and optimizing lists in general. With lists with uh, React Native, it seems to be a, uh, usually a stumbling block for most apps, where if you have a list of over <laughs> items, you have to kind of really, really figure out um, like where the problems are, if it has to do with your images, if it has to do with the um, the pagination, or if maybe you have like an infinite scroll, and you know, it really for me, it's been mostly with React Native versus React Web, and I don't think we have as good of tooling for performance as uh, as the web right now on React Native. That's actually really interesting because I haven't. I do more web, and it's it, that sounds so much easier. <laughs> 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 Whereas with web, it's like you're trying to you're trying to optimize your bundles and how much JavaScript is there and trying to reduce it so that there's less to download, parse and compile and load and um, figuring out if things are like above the fold or below the fold and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I started working more on that part. So I'm like, Oh, <laughs> the react side was, uh, I don't know. It's not easier. It's just different. Yeah, when I see discussions around performance on the web with React these days, I'm completely lost. When I see like <laughs> code splitting and Webpack and all this stuff, like I understand Webpack for sure, but I don't. I definitely don't have any clue how I would do the code splitting and, and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I used to be very afraid of Webpack, and then um, I started a vanilla application. It was just like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and that's when I finally learned Webpack. Thanks to I think you had Yuho on another time and. I look up so many things on Survive.js, but also the Webpack docs have gotten a lot better. It's really interesting, all the things you can do to just optimize, or it helps you optimize a lot of things automatically, like images and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, so I wonder how you would do that more in React Native, because you don't have the same build tool. Um, like, how would you say, hey, can you just optimize all these images for particular sizes and offer up different source sets? Um. So it's it's not as easy for sure with React Native. Um, it just depends. Um, you can have like you can you can have like uh, helper functions that that rely on certain data that like maybe how your network is is doing or the type of device you're on and kind of do it that way just by manually writing that 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 type of functionality in. At least in my experience. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point though about the differences between. Um, performance optimizations for the web versus React Native because um, just that very act of having to download your, your JS bundle up front makes things a lot more complicated, right? Um, and it's a double-edged sword. So you might um, defer um, so down downloading some code with code splitting so that you, you don't have it there immediately. Um, so that makes the, the initial download faster. But then that makes when you want to actually use that code that you need later, it makes it slower. Um, so you were, you were constantly trading off these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the time to interaction can be just as frustrating as like time to load um, or like time to like, when you see it on the screen, you usually expect it to work. And because of our delayed JavaScript, sometimes it doesn't. It's an interesting problem. Um, I had another question on that, but I was, it slipped my mind. Well, then, uh, then on top of that, that's just getting the bundle. Then uh, the other thing that we have to contend with is then um, the application performance itself, like uh, mm -hmm. having to check, well, is it, is it doing unnecessary renders and um, tracing down um, why things are um, changing the way they are? Um, I, I don't know how you guys, uh, do, do you guys do any of that uh, kind of performance optimization as well? 
Yeah, using like dev tools to look at renders and the pro profiling. Yeah. Not any specific tools right now. There used to be a perf uh, plugin for React, but they took it out of the core package. At, I forget at which point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I say that's a, an area where I do find uh, Redux is helpful because um, it has that magical time traveling debugger. Um, so being able to switch between states and say, okay, when we go from this state to this next state, uh, we can see here's all the um, bits of the DOM that have to change in response to that. Um, and being able to trace through which, which bits uh, um, maybe are, are rendering when they shouldn't or um, uh, are doing unnecessary work is really, really handy. Uh, have you any of you guys uh, tried the Redux um, time traveler and, and all that kind of stuff? I haven't done it specifically, but I do use a tool um, with Sentry that basically logs all my Redux actions that are performed. So it actually makes it a lot easier to debug errors in production because I know like the steps that the application has gone through um, and then I can try to repeat them. Yeah, that's, that's one of those magical things that just that, that one simple rule of, of reducers have to be pure kind of makes possible in um, Redux and kind of blew my mind when I first uh, learned about it was um, because it's just a sequence of actions and everything you need to know about the application is recorded in those actions. You can do things like, as you say, you can log all of them to a logger, um, which means that you can um, watch, watch things happen in real time or you could stream uh, people's actions um, if you're doing some kind of uh, live coding um, thing, for example, uh, and you get this time traveling debugger, uh, which we um, enable in, in our production app by with a special query string. Um, so we just detect a query string and we load, uh, load that middleware. Uh, and that means that we could say, for example, download the entire state of um, the application on a client's machine, um, put it on a disk, take it back to, to our workstation, and then spin up the application again and see it in exactly the same state that it was on the, the client's computer. And that's really handy for being able to debug things and work out why did this um, widget change the way it did or um, well, why was it throwing this error at this particular point in time. Uh, it's just kind of amazing when you see it. Um, and just being, you know, having a slider there, you can just roll it right back to the start, watch things load as they come in and out. Um, it's really fun. And then you use get blame to give somebody a hard time, right? <laughs> So one thing that I'm curious about, uh, the article said uh, Redux, React, and JavaScript architecture. And it seems like a lot of times, at least in my applications, um, some of the problems come down to, you know, oh, there's a tool that solves that, you know, and you're talking about Redux and, you know, some aspects of React are probably going to solve some of these issues too. But then you've got other things that is just like, you know what, I kind of designed this poorly and so now I'm paying the price on it. So how do you actually architect your apps? Like what, what principles do you follow in the way that you put your apps together in order to solve some of the issues that make applications more complicated or harder to debug or maintain? That's a, a really good question, actually. Um, and what, that's probably one of the key reasons why I'm, I'm now um, a, such a fan of React is that it strongly encourages you to break your uh, application down into small components. Uh, and then build, piece your application together from those small components using composition, uh, which is kind of a, a functional programming concept as well. Um, but because you're working with um, small isolated units that you can you can test easily, that, that means that um, it helps manage the complexity. Um, but then on top of that, you've got to think about uh, layers for um, getting the data into your code. So in our particular application, we have three different servers that we're talking to. Um, and we knew that sometimes they might need to change out. So we have a, a sort of uh, a network layer, I guess, that tries to normalize the way we're talking to different servers, even though they're, they're quite different in the types of, types of data that they are they're using. Uh, and then that sort of sits behind uh, the, the Redux store. And then on top of that, we have our React application, which uh, uses these small components yeah, I really like the idea of small components. Just being able to look at something and kind of at a glance see what it's about makes things really nicely. It was, I, I kind of had to get over, and, and I've heard this a lot, I kind of had to get over everything being in the same file with JSX. But once I got past that and realized that I could look at it and see what it was in one place, there were a lot of things I really liked about the approach. 
Yeah, actually, this is a good point um, that um, I, I probably don't make it talk enough about is that we actually have our own custom bundler. Um, so the way we structure our application is that we break it into uh, a folder full of modules and each of those modules contains uh, some sample HTML that we expect um, the component to output uh, plus the SAS file, uh, which has this, the CSS um, and then the, the, any JavaScript um, or JSX files that, that build the, the component. Um, so we're our custom bundler allows us to keep everything that's related to a single component all together in one folder. So it might not be in the same file, um, mm -hmm. but you can at least see in the structure of the way we've um, put our file, file tree together, everything that, that is in a module belongs together. Uh, and I think many people um, understand that that's a possibility when they're doing React uh, and Redux in particular, because they're, they're sort of, you often have all these reducers sitting in one massive file. Um, they, they make sort of, they, they get lost. Um, so I actually have to say that uh, the way you structure your file system does make a big difference to the maintainability of these larger applications. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I always struggle with that, or I go back and forth. I mean, how do you decide <laughs> what the best way to organize that is? I mean, like, uh, is it, you know, like by feature or by you know, like containers versus components, and then also like how do you organize your actions and reducers along with all of those. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess the, the, the question of how you break down um, uh, features versus components is always going to be a tough one. Uh, and you kind of have to just do that by feel, I guess. But uh, my rule is um, everything related to the component goes with the component. So if there's, um, we normally try and keep the actions and reduces together. So I, maybe I should explain, do you guys know about the um, container component pattern? Um, yeah, yes. so we we try and keep our uh, all our view components as pure functional components. Um, so all they have is a render um, method, and that's it. Um, so that makes keeps those very simple. And then in the container component, that's where all the business logic actually lives. So all the action generators are in there, unless there's a heck of a lot of them, in which case we'll split them out. Uh, but all the re reducers uh, live in that that um, component as well. Um, so everything you need to know about the business logic of that component lives in that container component. Uh, that's just our rule for how we do it. Um, for a smaller application, I can see why you might want to keep all the reducers or all the actions in one file. Um, but to me, that never made a lot of sense. Uh, so I, I much prefer to keep the logic of when I'm thinking about a single component, I just want everything for that component in one place. I don't want to have to go searching through the file system for it. Yeah, that reminds me of... Uh in object-oriented programming, single responsibility principle. Uh, a lot of people think of it as, you know, you, your um, object or class has one job, but what it really means is that um, everything in that class, or in our case, our component, are things that are likely to change at the same time. And so if you keep them together, then you can go and you can see the entire concern at once. And so, you know, that's kind of what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, all of your reducers, all of your, even though they're all parts of different layers, because they're all likely to change at the same time, you put them all together so that you can just work on that one feature component, whatever you want to call it at the same time. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, a, um, I'd forgotten that was the name of it um, from my uh, software engineering uh, study dates. But uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, just, just instinctually, I suppose. I wanted to take a step back for a second, because as I was reading your article on React, Redux, and JavaScript architecture, I realized, oh, and then also, like, your next one, what's the point of art? I realized, like, you have this pattern of, uh, like, a deep thinking on a topic explored through the written word, and um, I found it really interesting. Like, how do you, or I guess what, in your opinion, helps you to think of these things in this way or break down some of those concepts in order to... Um, really convey what people need to learn. I'm very interested in how people learn, I guess, because that whole like speaking and teaching workshops and things like that, it's, it's very interesting to me. Yeah, I guess um, like most people, uh, I think I often write uh, out of a sense of personal frustration. <laughs> uh, uh, it helps me get, get my thoughts straight on, uh, on what things uh, I'm, I'm challenged to repeated patterns or repeated conversations that I'm having with people. So the, 
the React one article and the, one of my previous ones on, on test-driven development, like I found that I was having the same conversation over and over with people that unit testing is not the same thing as test-driven development, uh, even though um, lots of times we accidentally uh, use those terms interchangeably. They're very different things. Um, and it, I had a sort of epiphany one day when I realized that the whole point of test-driven development isn't actually getting tests. Um, they're just a side effect. Um, what's really good about test driven development it is it teaches people to code in really, really small, tiny increments. Um, and so I gave a presentation on that to um, some of the guys at Squiz. Uh, and then um, once, and because I'd been having these conversations, it just kind of flowed and I, I wanted to put that down on paper after I'd done it and uh, published it as an article. How about you guys? I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, I think most of you um, write in one way or another or prepare talks. Um, how, do, how do you guys um, uh, start your thinking process for those kinds of things? Sia, you've been doing a lot of this lately. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Or maybe I, sometimes it's frustration. I think you dive deeper than I do, but I, um, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but uh, I feel like when I feel like I don't know something well enough, that I need to more deeply explore it. And I kind of chart that progress as I go. And that, cause I'm like, Oh, this could help someone else. How can I help the next person? Um, and so a lot of the ones I talk about are like new things to me, <laughs> which is probably makes you not the most qualified person to talk about it. But, um, but then also, I don't know. I feel like it's, easier for people that are new to it to approach that type of um, a talk or, or um, article or, or whatnot, because it's from that standpoint of someone who isn't so deep in it that they forget, you know, what they didn't know before they knew it. That, that's totally fair. I mean, the, there are, it's so easy to forget how hard it is for people who are new to uh, these concepts or even to our industry mm -hmm. uh, because uh, some of us, like me, have been doing it since the, the days of IE6 and um, the browser walls and all of that. Uh, but for, for new people, it must be so overwhelming. Like uh, Webpack on its own is, is complicated enough, uh, let alone React and Redux and uh, all these things. Um, so I, I more power to the people who are uh, writing about the things as they're learning them so that we don't lose that perspective on things. Yeah, also, I kind of have, I have a similar story as far as preparing talks and stuff like that. I usually am either that, like, brand new to something or the complete opposite. I'm, like, really deep into something because, like, I feel like for me to do a talk on it, I need to be really excited about it. And it's really easy for me to get excited about something I'm learning and or that I want to learn. So I'll usually get a talk um, put together around combining, like, a new topic along with something else that's interesting. And usually meshing those two things together can come mm -hmm. up with some interesting topics. And then if it gets accepted, I'll um, spend the next couple of months like learning it well enough to be able to talk about it. Um, or if it's something I already know really well, then I feel you know comfortable you know talking about it as well. But it's interesting that you said, like uh, I think you're right when it comes to teaching something. Um, and if you're if you're doing something for so long, you just you have a lot of assumptions that usually are not correct because you you just forgot a lot of the things that you you didn't know that you didn't. Uh, no, like a long time ago. So when you're learning something new and you're teaching it, you're almost a better teacher sometimes than people that have been doing it for 10 years or so. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I also like how um, clearly you have a creative side as well. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes struggle because I like to encourage that part. But it's like I love to write applications, but I also feel like you get so, or maybe I do, so into the zone and so focused that it's hard to like take that step back and give time to like just that thought and rumination, which is really required for like deep thinking on a concept. So I'm kind of curious as to how you make that time or, or how you, how you, I don't know. <laughs> this might be also like the frustration with social media and getting like addicted to things and like, how do you take that step back and like uh, open your mind to more creative things and innovative things? Uh, I could probably kind of approach it from the opposite direction in that I kind of use uh, writing as a way to force myself to think um, because we are all caught up in this uh, constant on, um, like if I'm not on Twitter, then I'm probably listening to a podcast. Um, and so 
I, I need something like writing to force me to turn the headphones off and um, step away from the social media. And uh, I just find that, um, unfortunately for me, uh, 4,000 words is about the right amount of um, time to, to, to get that thinking done, uh, which, which makes for some long articles. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but they're great. I really like them. This has been a fun conversation. We've kind of talked about a lot of different things. Yeah, we have bounced right. around a little bit. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do some picks, and that way uh, James can go back to bed for a couple hours or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Take it out. Over there in Australia. Uh, and you uh, too. No, I have to go pick up my kids from school. Oh, um, right. Natter, why don't you start us out with picks? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. Sure. So um, my pick is a self-serving pick this week. It's my YouTube channel. I've been I've been I've been having a YouTube channel for React Native training for a long time. We have a few thousand subscribers there. I've since also created my own YouTube channel, um, and I have a few hundred followers now or subscribers. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff that isn't React Native specific, but but some React Native stuff there. So my React Native training YouTube is all React Native stuff. My personal channel is going to be more around JavaScript, GraphQL, and um, just things that aren't, you know, of course, React Native specific. I'm doing a lot of AWS stuff too. So a lot of uh, App Sync stuff will be there and Amplify as well. So um, I don't have like a YouTube URL yet, but um, if you just Google Natter, Dabit YouTube, um, or if you go to my Twitter feed, I'm, I'm Dabit3 on Twitter you'll see me tweeting about my YouTube videos that I'm putting out. And that's it for me. Awesome. Sia, do you want to do some picks? Yeah, I don't know what they are, though. <laughs> so, oh, oh, my uh, God, I forgot to... to <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll blame Natter. Yeah. <laughs> then, well, I've given her like an email with all the information, and I like, completely left that off. <laughs> so yeah. what is the pick? <laughs> I, I like delegating blame. This is good. <laughs> Um, so, get blamed. Yeah, essentially picks are just shout outs about things that we like. So oh, cool. it can be technology, okay. it can be TV shows, books. I mean, we have oh, yeah, yeah. Pick all kinds of stuff. So sort of whatever's making your life awesome right now, that's what you pick. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do this and <laughs> I'm going to jump on the AWS bandwagon again. But um, I recently, we had collision comp here in New Orleans. I live in New Orleans and um, Amazon did like these full day multi-talk, um, they called them workshops, but they were more like talks. And it was really interesting to see a lot more of the AI and machine learning stuff. And I think before I had seen this one talk by um, Awesome Hussain, who's actually an Azure developer mm-hmm. advocate maybe, um, about the bot of the US, I didn't really realize how approachable um, artificial intelligence is nowadays. And so I really want to play around with that. I started making a bot <laughs> for like speaker feedback, which was entertaining. And um, I really want to learn more. And then of course, taking that, starting using that as a starting point, like dump, diving into machine learning as well. I think it would be really cool stuff. Yeah, I was at Microsoft Build last week and they, they talked a bit about their bot services. Cool stuff. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks myself. Uh, one of the first things that I just want to do is um, I want to briefly, um, I, I missed the last few episodes. I almost didn't make it to this one. Um, and it's it's mostly, well, part of it was travel and part of it was just that my dad passed away a few weeks ago and I've just been kind of dealing with life. Um, and so mostly I just want to pick, you know, 
being around family and friends and just taking the time to, you know, to see everybody and get to, you know, the people you haven't seen in a while, you know, take a minute to reach out. I, I mean, I saw people, including some cousins that I hadn't seen in a few years. And, you know, it's kind of sad to me now just to think, oh, you know what? Um, if something happened to them, you know, it'd be like, oh, well, the last time I saw them was a few years ago. You know, their kids were really little. And you know, anyway, um, so yeah, so take a few minutes just to spend some time with family and friends and, you know, make sure that you're spending your life doing the things that really matter. Um, you know, coding, you know, the things that we do here, I feel like they do matter because we do help people, but it, 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 it all contributes to the larger quality of life that we have. And, uh, you know, so don't lose sight of all of the other things and all of the people in your life that matter. Um, and yeah, I, it's a little self-reflective, but that's kind of where I've been living the last few weeks. So anyway, uh, James, do you have some picks for us? Uh, I feel it's kind of hard to follow that one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but, uh, no, totally agree. Um, I do, I do have some, some small ones. Uh, so, uh, the first one is, uh, a package called Highland JS. Um, and what that is, is I don't know if you guys have ever experimented much with uh, reactive programming like RxJS or BaconJS. Um, what Highland does is it puts that same layer uh, over node streams. So if you've ever done node programming, it um, allows you to treat node streams as if they were uh, a reactive um, stream or an observable. Um, and so I, I wrote my whole blog engine with this because uh, Gulp, um, works with node streams. Uh, and so you could take a gulp stream, transform it into a reactive stream and use all your reactive programming techniques um, to build out your uh, static site. Uh, so that was really fun. Um, and I think this particular package just doesn't get enough recognition for the amazing stuff that it does. So I wanna tell people about it. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, and the other thing I wanted to, um, to pick um, just quickly was uh, functional programming in general. Um, I'm really um, enjoying the way it changes the way I think about code. Um, and so I'm uh, enjoying it so much that I'm, I'm planning to, to write a book about it. Um, so um, that's just been filling my head lately. And it just is, is so much fun to uh, think differently and to um, see the way that it, it plays out and makes coding more magical. Nice. I have a quick question about Highland JS. Is this something that you could plug into, say, RxJS and start using some of their operators and things like that on? Or um, it's more that it has uh, many of the same operators uh, built okay. into it. So it, it kind of does the same thing that RxJS does for events. Uh, it does for node streams. Cool. One other thing I just want to shout out about then is uh, if you're having trouble getting into Functional programming, we just had Kyle Simpson on JavaScript Jabber, and we talked about his book, Functional Like JavaScript. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of was, I had trouble getting my head around it, and he kind of dumbed it down for me. So, Yeah, I'll always be thankful to Redux for teaching me more about functional programming. Awesome. Yeah. Well, James, if people want to see what you're working on now or follow you online, uh, where do they go? Uh, you can find my website at jrsinclair.com and uh, on Twitter at jrsinclair. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, we will go ahead and wrap this up and we will catch everybody next week. Cheers. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit dot to learn more.